One thing that's clear to everyone who sees this wonderful DVD, these three, these four very experienced men have described wonderfully well what peace could bring and why it's needed. And they all agree that it is the U.S.'s job to see that it happens and it could happen sooner rather than later with the right kind of American leadership. That's the theme of the whole affair. But it's always easier for big shots to talk about big ideas than little shots to talk about the details. So we're going to go after a few of the details. But first, the first question. President Carter says uh, early on, in answer to Landrum's question, that he's never lost faith in the probability or the inevitability of peace. Do you all agree? Jonathan? I agree, um, but uh, again, as you say, the devil is in the details. Um, I think there is always a good uh, chance to move forward to that uh, final agreement, but uh, a lot needs to be done before we reach that agreement. I should have bounded the question this way. Do you agree that peace is inevitable within the next two decades? I don't. Thank you. Zian? I do. Uh, I, I think that uh, no conflict or war goes on forever. Even the 100 years war lasted for 100 years only. Uh, and, and I think there is only one solution for this uh, problem. The others are continuation of the conflict in other means. That one solution is a two-state solution that I believe everybody was talking about. There is, in, 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 in by now, an international consensus about and this. And in 20 years, it's achievable. In 20 years, I would put it at the outer end, that 20 years window. Tony? I do agree. I think that as all of the, as you say, quote unquote, big shots commented, um, we now have a president with um, bold ideas and new leadership. And um, uh, he has made it absolutely clear this is a priority um, in his administration. And he has um, made it not only a priority, he is acting on that priority. Uh, I believe that the, as uh, Secretary Baker commented, and we all know, the polling data also indicates that um, uh, the body politic supports. Okay. So you think it's possible? I think it's possible. In, two, in 20 years or less? I think within less. It has to be possible. Okay. Now, a few of the specifics for the other three questions. It's interesting, I think, to any of us who follow these issues, that all four of them argued we have to talk to everybody, including Hamas. Baker put it this way, you need to at least find a, cons a construct for the voices of Hamas, which means, I guess, you need to work through intermediaries. But they all essentially argued you cannot resolve the conflict without really engaging Hamas in a reunification. Jonathan, what do you think about that? I think uh, that that is essentially true, uh, but I think another step needs to be taken first. Uh, one of the things that I talk about in my book is the fact that the Palestinians are engaged in a brutal civil war at this time. Uh, they've been engaged in this war since June of 2007. Uh, Hamas and Fatah uh, each control one territory. Hamas controls Gaza. Fatah controls the West Bank. Uh, and we are now in a place of uh, complete chaos. Uh, we don't know who actually speaks for the Palestinians. The Israelis don't have an interlocutor. I think engaging Hamas is probably important insofar as we need to get the Palestinians all on the same page. There needs to be a unified Palestinian leadership. And then at that point, I think we can get back to the negotiating table. But this is one of the main reasons why I'm pessimistic. Uh, both of the Palestinian factions seems, seem to be entrenched right now uh, in their own territories, and there does not seem to be uh, uh, a very good chance, at least at this point, of moving forward towards a unified Palestinian uh, national identity, if you will. But should the U.S. directly engage Hamas? 
No. In my opinion, I think the, the U.S. should do what it's doing now, which is to ask Egypt or the Arab League or the Saudis or the Yemenis, uh, the Mauritanians. I mean, the list goes on, but they've been, uh, we've been working with uh, a number of Arab governments to try to get the Palestinians uh, to come together to create a unity government. Uh, and, you know, and that really stems from uh, U.S. policy dating back towards uh, the time of Richard, uh, Richard Nixon, where the United States does not engage with uh, terrorist organizations. So we're getting others to try to work out a Palestinian unity deal. If and when that happens, uh, you know, and Hamas is part of a unity government that accepts uh, the existence of the state of Israel, does not call it the Zionist entity, does not seek its destruction through some factions and engages with, with others, then I think we are, uh, you know, at least on the right path to uh, a negotiated peace uh, agreement. Zian, what do you think about that? Well, I think everybody's talking to everybody all the time. There is no lacking in communication. I think there, right now, officially, it is understood that the Egyptians are talking all, uh, on behalf of the Israelis with, with Hamas and, and, and vice versa, for instance. The same messages are being carried. I think the, the question is, is should the, nego the United States talk directly to Hamas and publicly? Uh, and I think here is a, 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 a construct that I thought that um, Secretary Baker came up with that would answer that question satisfactorily. There has to be a construct that is acceptable, precisely like the one that was uh, uh, formulated for the uh, discussions with the PLO 20 decades ago in order to get into this. What is very bothersome about the present situation is the back to the no Palestinian partner canard. That is a disaster. That you, you, know, you make the Palestinian leadership weak and you turn around and you call them uh, 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 too weak to, to deliver. You also uh, have a divided situation and you say we cannot get to talk to anybody till that situation is is fixed you have to have a unity government the problem with the unity government if i just might take the problem with the unity government is the following the palestinians are put in a position either they do unity government and 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 then the united states and israel stop talking to them and delivering policy and money or they do not uh, form a unity government, at which case the Arabs, including the Egyptians and the Saudis and others, will not deliver anything to them. So it's damn if you do and damn if you don't. Ziad has put his finger on a point I think does deserve looking at. I don't quite agree, Jonathan, that we've been encouraging a unity government through all sorts of other channels. We and the Israelis have both taken the position publicly no unity government until they meet three very rigid conditions. And I don't think you can say we've been encouraging it up to this point, even mm -hmm. indirectly. Tony? Well, wait just a minute. Let's give uh, Tony a chance. Sarah, I, I agree with you. Um, I also think it's important to reflect on the fact that Hamas is not a monolith, and you've got a multiplicity of voices uh, within uh, the Hamas factions. And so when you speak of Hamas, who are we reaching out to? I think that the concept of trying to create a uh, political construct uh, is very important. And we, as Ziad references, we are talking uh, through intermediaries with Hamas. I think it's important also, and I'd like us to probe on this issue of partner. Um, we need to be much more practical as we move in these next steps taking into account um, the very robust, proactive nature of U.S. leadership at the moment. And we need to look at the practicalities on the ground and play out in a very clear timeline what needs to happen on the ground and get into this issue of Palestinian partner. Okay, but you, sh you would not talk directly to Hamas now Not at either. this point. No, this I would point. not. 30 seconds? Well, uh, I, uh, just to... Uh, address your point, the United States has been actively working with Egypt to help create a unity government. Uh, and it's not as if uh, Israel and the United States don't want to see a unity government. They're actually, I would say, both governments have tried to step back to not exacerbate the problems uh, that uh, have uh, essentially uh, come to characterize the uh, hamas fatah conflict. Uh, not wanting to engage directly has been a wise thing. To have the United States step in and try to say, well, this is what a unity government should look like, would be rejected by the Palestinians outright. So it is, uh, the U.S. has been taking a hands-off approach, asking other Arab uh, leaders to step in to try to create this unity government. So I, I think it's an unfair characterization to say that, we are, that we're not trying to get there. I think we very much are, but understand the, uh, the trickiness involved in reaching that point. 
Okay, well, we can debate that off, off camera sometime a little bit. Uh, Tony, you get the second question. Brent uh, Scowcroft, among actually all of them, one way or another, uh, indicated they think everybody knows what the outcome is going to be. It's all been discussed in the Taba Accords at the end of the Clinton administration. They reached essentially agreement on the four major problems. Of course, the Taba Accords were never either authorized or accepted, but nonetheless. Um, is the Palestinian-Israeli deal that people say we all know what it is, all we have to do is get leaders who will be courageous and sign it, and that you hear on all fronts, not just from these four gentlemen. Is that really the case? Is the deal really so easily <laughs> translated into just a leadership signature problem? Um, interesting question. I think it is more than not. Um, and the reality, we are all working around the margins of what Brent uh, refers to in terms of Taba. It's how you go about uh, negotiating those details of the June 467 borders, uh, the land swaps, um, how you deal with uh, settlement blocks, which settlements, how you uh, create compensation packages, when, and the sequencing. Um, your question also only speaks to the issue of the Israeli-Palestinian deal. The reality is if you're looking at a more comprehensive nature with introducing Syria and Lebanon, you've got a lot more flexibility and influence because you are also getting to the heart of uh, some what I call deposits that might be effective when you discuss the issue of Syria, Syria's influence uh, with regard to uh, terror. Let me drill down a little bit more on what you said, though. You didn't okay. mention Jerusalem. Is Jerusalem. the deal on Jerusalem something everybody understands and is ready to swallow? Uh, that is a little more nebulous. I think that yes, but is what I would say. Needs a little bit more education, but I would like to reference uh, the, um, the Arab Peace Initiative and in bringing Saudi Arabia into the mix makes a Jerusalem deal uh, and it's uh, and the details on Jerusalem that much easier for a Palestinian Israeli agreement. Okay, Jonathan, how about Jerusalem? Do you think the Israelis are understand what the deal is and are ready to sign it if they just had a strong leader? Well, I think there was uh, what uh, Ehud Barak put forward at Camp David II and the Taba. Uh, and then, of course, we have a new prime minister in Israel right now who uh, may or not be as willing uh, to, to see uh, territory within Jerusalem. But broadly speaking, looking at uh, what was on the table at, at Camp David II in Ataba, uh, we know how that ended. And uh, the Palestinians uh, flatly rejected the offer uh, without a counteroffer. And this is something that has been attested to by uh, the likes of Dennis Ross and Martin Indyk and President Clinton. So we know that the Palestinians were not eager to engage in this sort of package deal, the same one that we heard about during this discussion uh, during this DVD. And now things have actually gotten much more complex. You had Hamas actually win an election uh, in, uh, in January of 2006, uh, attesting to the fact that the Palestinians overwhelmingly support an organization that made its name through suicide bombings and attacks against Israeli civilians. And then add to that the question of, uh, you know, uh, Palestinian leadership. I know it's an uncomfortable question, Ziad, but it is one that needs to be dealt with, the fact that we still don't know who would actually sign that agreement. My argument is that even if Israel tomorrow decided that it wanted to cede every settlement in the West Bank, remove all the strictures around the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, hand over every part of Muslim uh, Jerusalem, and even allow a nominal number of Palestinian refugees to live inside Israel proper, there would be nobody on the other side side to ratify that agreement. In other words, if Fatah got involved and signed that agreement, Hamas would reject it outright, and there's no way that Hamas would accept it. Whereas so, you would argue that there is an Israeli leader who would sign that same agreement? I'm not saying that they would sign the exact agreement that we saw <laughs> back in Ta back in Taba and Camp David, but if any agreement was to be was to be made, at least we would know who would sign it on the Israeli side. 
we all know we're, we're Netanyahu's, uh, well, we, at least we think we're Netanyahu stands on some of these issues, and I'm not expecting him to run back to the negotiating table, but if there was an agreement to be made and if compromises were to be struck, at least we know who would sign it on the Israeli side. Sam, I have two points. Can I have two <laughs> fingers? Because <laughs> I want Ziad, and I know he will offer just quickly on Camp David. I, too, was at Camp David. Um, it was not that simple. We did not do some of our homework as well. And on Jerusalem, Ehud Barak tabled a number of uh, proposals. We didn't know going into Camp David where the Israelis were going to be on the issue of proposals on Jerusalem. So we couldn't even engage the other uh, interested parties. So some of that, I'm not absolving um, the Palestinians of their you know, willingness to embrace right then and there. But uh, we didn't do enough preparation either, so it wasn't that simple. Yeah, you're on the. You know, so many points have been raised. Yeah. <laughs> Pick out the easy one. Yeah, <laughs> Jerusalem, of course. Uh, no, the uh, Jerusalem. Yeah, it should be shared, and at some point in time, people will will uh, will come to that conclusion because of so many complications. Uh, on the issue of the of the uh, status quo. The status quo has steadily been a declining curve. Forty years ago, we had 16,000 settlers or so. And now we have almost half a million, 450,000. And that is why the question of freezing the settlements is so crucial. You cannot go on negotiating a two-state solution while somebody is munching on that piece of bread. It just cannot be done. So that is why it's significant. It also is significant because of the issue of the credibility of, of the people who are actually negotiating. Now, who would negotiate? I think it's very clear. The PLO would negotiate as long as there, it is actually the one that is authorized to negotiate. And Abu Mazen is the one who is the head of the PLO, whether he is the head of the PA uh, authority or not. The PA is a creature of the PLO. So it is possible to negotiate. And it is also very important to know, at some point in time, the Palestinians will subject that agreement that they come up with to a referendum. The Palestinians between now and then, when that negotiation is concluded, have to go through elections. So it is, that, that reflects on the Hamas issue. Hamas is, is a non-state actor. Uh, the settlers are a non-state actor, too. They, in part, they also do some state business, but they are also a non-state actor. I haven't heard too many people talking about the settlers, you know, external to Israel and say, okay, should we negotiate with them a deal? So these, these, these issues have to be worked out, you know, uh, seriously, not, not without, uh, uh, on, the, on the question of the, the Jerusalem component to this, whether there's an agreement to it or not, well, Jerusalem is beyond the Israelis and the Palestinians. It's just bigger than these two people. There is a whole world of, of, of religious people globally who would be interested in that solution, and no one can stand with an exclusive yeah. commitment to, to, to run Jerusalem. That is why if, if the Israelis make a religious claim on Jerusalem and the West Bank, they should not be surprised if others will make a counter-religious claim, and that will be a non-solution. So we're talking about a solution. Let me just make this point that um, the, the essence of my question on Jerusalem is, has anybody actually come up with a solution that would work? Now, there is a non-governmental organization designing mm -hmm. a formula, mm -hmm. quite an interesting formula for the old city. city. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But it's non-governmental. It's a good idea. Maybe yeah. someday it'll be part of the deal. Mm -hmm. The Clinton parameters at the end of the Clinton administration described a Jerusalem in which Israel has sovereignty in Jewish areas, Palestinians have sovereignty in Palestinian areas, and they left kind of vague what happens in the middle. But the point is, if you look at Jerusalem today, you cannot imagine dividing East Jerusalem that way because there are large enclaves of Jewish settlements in East Jerusalem. You can't have separate police forces interacting. So the formula for Jerusalem isn't there at this stage that would be viable. That's, and so that's a lot of negotiating to do. That's yeah. really my point. It's not yeah. something that is awaiting only decisions yeah. by governments. Yeah. There are three, three levels for Jerusalem 
every one of them is very relevant. One is the political arrangement, two is the municipal arrangement, yeah. three is the religious ar arrangement. Right. All of these right. have to be genuinely negotiated. But <clears throat> the principle has to be established. And I think this is where there, there cannot be a serious disagreement uh, on part of people who want to negotiate that they will have an exclusive uh, ownership of Jerusalem. Uh, c c c nothing, nothing will continue beyond and that. Sam, to drill down on oh, the wait, Jerusalem. Wait a minute, let me give oh. Jonathan a chance. Oh. Do you want to comment on this last Well, point? yeah, and, and I think um, I think Ziad has, has an excellent point. I mean, there are those three levels, and they're going to be exceedingly difficult to uh, to reach an agreement, I would say, on each one of them. I, I think that yeah. uh, there, there are no easy solutions. But what it comes down to, in my mind, is that you know, if you're dealing with people who truly want peace, you begin to make compromises. And I don't know if we're if if if, if we're really there yet. I mean, uh, I think we're looking at, at, at several entrenched positions uh, and not really moving towards a center and anything. And that was, I you know, if you were there, then you know. But uh, you know, that was not the the atmosphere. Uh, there was this is our red line. We're not we're not stepping past that. And that's been the problem with Jerusalem all along. And it's you know, and there's a reason why you deal with Jerusalem last. You know, uh, it's the hardest question, and it will always be the hardest question. It evokes tremendous emotion, and, uh, you know, I wouldn't expect it to be any different the next time around whenever that happens. I think um, on Jerusalem, and Sam, your point's well taken in terms of the details, but in the intervening years post Camp David, and you referenced um, the Windsor uh, study, a lot of work is being done on different models. Those are going to be referenced by the negotiators. Yeah. And, um, but I think Ziad and Jonathan's absolutely correct. If you have a political will, then there's more willingness, um, and you've got a recognition of. Um, the, the parties will come together to deal with these details. On the municipal level, that's the day-to-day. -day. And if you go back to where we were, unfortunately, in the last eight years, we got away from the trilateral arrangements that we had in the Clinton administration. What was effective in the, those trilateral arrangements, we had Americans, Israelis, and Palestinians working in a number of different venues all the time. They became very used to working through issues constantly. Now that needs to be reinvented again and to start drilling down into those details. There is, there, we, negotiators tend to get very heavily engaged in the political side of this issue. You're absolutely right. But as somebody has already pointed out, the religious issue has become more and more and more central over the last decades. Uh, interfaith talks everybody's in favor of, some take place. Uh, but the basic formula for persuading Israelis that their religious cent centrality of the Western Wall and the Old City, particularly the Western Wall, is something that can be negotiated about, or that the Al-Aqsa Mosque and who runs it is a negotiating issue rather than an issue of religious sovereignty, and that you got to have Saudi Arabia bless everything on behalf of the Muslim world all of these things are really central to reaching a final Jerusalem formula. And I don't think we've ever found a way well to mesh our political negotiation style and approaches, any of us, with the religious side of the problem. Does that make sense to you all? Yeah, sure. Yes, I, think, I think the issue of, of religion can possibly be handled on this earth in the, in, in the following fashion. You're entitled to your religion and you're entitled to your beliefs, and you're entitled to whatever it is that you think of land and space and metaphysical things. But here we have to deal with specifics and practicalities. So you can always have the faith that you want about the attachment to the land, but you cannot apply it your way exclusive of other people's metaphysical affiliations. Well, there's one last question. It's supposed to go to Ziad. <laughs> this, is easy. Ready. this is easy, Ziad. I think you can handle this. You noted that all four of our speakers in the DVD essentially agreed with Spig and Brent. It was Spig made the point first, Brent seconded it. I think both Carter and Baker basically agree. What's lacking in even the current Obama much more energetic interventionist approach 
is a clear statement by the American president that this are, these are the key principles on which we believe, and it's our policy to see they come about, we can get a deal. Not every detail, but a lot of detail, a lot of principles that get to the heart of all of the arguments. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if the American president, the current one, by some miracle, uh, made a speech like that in the next month or two, and there's been talk in the administration about trying to do something of this kind, and they're still arguing, I think, how forward-leaning they should be on laying down principles instead of waiting to make bridging proposals once you get into negotiations. That's been our traditional approach. Were he to do it, would everybody, all these 52 countries that are mentioned, all the Europeans, all the Arabs, Palestinians, would everybody fall in line because of the prestige of the American position and the power of the American dictat? What no. do you think? No, there is no, there is no such thing. I mean, there is, there is no <laughs> such thing that, that the United States is in a position to have some statement said, whatever it is, and then everybody will fall in line. But having said that, let me just say, say two things. One is the fact that uh, solving this issue is a U.S. national issue. It is not, you know, it's fine, it's fine for the Palestinians, the Israelis, and all these people in the Middle East, but it is a national priority for the United States. This is the basis for the position for the uh, United States President's speech that you're talking yeah. about, uh, statement of principle. He's already said that. He's already said that, and I think that is something to build on. The other is that the time will have to come and will come, and it is going to come during the, the, the presidency of, uh, of Mr. Obama, uh, and I agree with you on that at some point in time, where those principles will be laid down. And they are close to what our Taba was about. They're going to be close to what our Taba. Before that, I do not think this will be the beginning. I doubt that this will be the opening position of the United States President to say this is how it is. I think he will leave room for, for uh, structures and institutions, etc. Essentially, uh, between the Palestinians and Israelis at first, but with uh, with uh, with other players, think significant he players. Do that, I think it is indispensable that the United States be ready to 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 lay down those principles and bridge the gaps and bridge the gaps. That will carry so much authority when it is done properly with enough work internationally to line up the support for it, including inside of Israel and inside of Palestine. What do you think, John? Well, I think that uh, what we saw after Camp David and Taba uh, was the president coming out and saying these are the principles uh, upon which a peace agreement will have to be made, and we had a rejection of that from the Well, uh, but from wait the a minute. We didn't side. have the, the president didn't stay in office to pursue it. That's true, and, and that was to his detriment, and I actually fully agree with the fact that, you know, you need to see engagement happen sooner, but the fact is, is that the international community, we're talking about how the world will respond. The international community left President Clinton, in my opinion, <coughs> hanging. Uh, I don't believe that the international community rallied behind the president as he was leaving office and said, we're going to keep pushing this, this ball forward. Things, uh, you know, fell apart, the intifada began, and the international community essentially pulled back and let the Arab-Israeli conflict uh, rage. And, uh, you know, this was a problem, but I think it was, it was demonstrative of how the international community, particularly the Europeans and the Arab world, are willing to let things go back to the status quo. And, and that's, it's unfortunate, but I think it's, it's essentially a fact now. So you think there's still, they would still hang back at this point? I think, it, and, and this is uh, not something that I'm particularly pleased with, you know, it, it, it falls on the shoulders of the United States to push these agreements forward, and when they fail, uh, the United States uh, takes the brunt of it. I don't know how many of you read the statement made by the Quartet in Trieste just last month. It's a rather extraordinarily for, forward-leaning and agreed position, Russia, the European community, the UN, and ourselves. Now. We haven't gone beyond that, but even that far is a pretty lively amount of unity about where one should go. Statements are wonderful. I'd like to see more engagement. Tony? Uh, I think that the, it's a question of timing when the president will. Um, you think he, if he did it at the right time, it would have the effect that they said it would have? And based upon uh, very robust diplomatic engagement right. and preparation, mm -hmm. yes, right. it would have that impact, but it would be based on timing and engagement. Let's say it has that impact on the world, 
would it have that impact on the Israeli government and the Palestinian government? I suspect that when he um, takes that bold step, he will have the conditioning would have been uh, done with both Israelis and Palestinians, and it would it would be the right timing. Enough of the uh, Senator Mitchell and his team would uh, feel the timing was right to would give you that get through this boost. calendar year without doing it? That's a very interesting question. Um, we know he's going to be pretty busy <laughs> <laughs> next year. Yeah. I would look towards the end of this calendar year. This president does pretty bold, and um, oh, I, so I. Right after he passes the health reform plan. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and remember, Sam, the, you you just referenced health. Um, the Congress is um, you know standing by him, and they're willing to support him as he's going forward on the House and Senate, and that's important. This political okay, dynamic. I feel has a, I feel a sense of of restlessness to my left <laughs> down here. So why don't we quit talking among ourselves? Paul, do you have anybody else?